Wonderful. Hello, everybody. I'm Athura Mothra, the Director of Legal Research at the Center for Art Law, and I'm so excited to welcome you to our event, Fan Art and Fair Use, Issues in IP Law for Inspired Creatives. Before I introduce our instructor for the day, and as per usual, let me let you know a little bit about the Center for Art Law and what we do. We are a Brooklyn-based research and education nonprofit, and we're dedicated to offering resources and programming to advance the arts and law community. Through our website, our newsletters, our events, we disseminate information and try to keep our audience updated on everything art law, news, programs, cases, publications, movies, and a lot more. We also facilitate tons of conversations by hosting and participating in programs such as ours today. And of course, this doesn't even begin to cover everything we do. So we invite you to subscribe to our newsletter if you haven't already to receive updates. We also share exciting stories of galleries, contemporary exhibits, immersive art experiences, and even artist features on our Instagram and social media. So be sure to check those out. We have a lot of fun things lined up. You may also consider becoming a premium member to receive offers and discounts for our events and access to our case law corner articles and the recordings of our past events. This fall, we have a webinar on BS for blockchain coming up, a primer on artist trusts. We have a legal clinic on legacy and estate planning, where we pair artists and attorneys together for one-on-one -on -one consultations. And we have our very first ever distinguished lecture on the Andy Warhol case, including the oral arguments that took place in October as an in-person event in New York at Westwood Gallery in December. So you can view these on our website and register for hopefully all of them so we can see more of you. A few of the usual housekeeping items. The program is being recorded for archival purposes, but we would love to see you. So please feel free to keep your cameras on. Once the videos are available, we will send across a recording of the session and a survey for the event as well. If you have any questions for our speaker, we will have a question and answer session so you can put them in the chat box. Now, finally, coming to our topic for today. What is fan art? It's any kind of artwork that's on a medium, whether it's digital or physical, that features a character or some kind of a scenery that wasn't originally created or invented by the artist that's selling the artwork. It can be art, novels, story, short stories, merchandise that features very well-known references or characters. Many artists create artwork based on their favorite cultural icons, whether it's Taylor Swift or Harry Potter, artwork, fan fiction. There is so much that is built from just a character. Sometimes these new works are classic fan art, meaning that they celebrate the original characters and they pay some sort of an homage to the character. But how much of a work can an artist borrow to create a new work? Is it considered a new work? Is it infringement or is it transformative? How is this decided? Can fan art be commissioned? Can it be sold online without permission? Do you have to have some sort of a notice? What happens if someone or even the character or celebrity of the fan art uses your fan art? Is that infringement? I know I have a ton of questions that I'm posing, so I'm more than excited to introduce our speaker, Heidi Tandy, partner in Berger Singerman's Miami office, who has over 25 years of experience in copyright and trademark with a long-standing focus on fair use and transformative works, who can hopefully answer all of these questions. Heidi has handled matters involving the internet, social media, privacy, intellectual property, and technology law issues. She's worked with content creators, technology builders, business owners, large corporations, and so, so many more. You can read her full bio in the handouts for today, which will be sent to you shortly. But for now, and without any further ado, Heidi, we are so excited to hear from you. Um, the Zoom screen is, is all yours. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here today. I'm going to switch on share screen for me. And hopefully my slides are running. 
Okay, good. Um, so um, as Atreya was saying, I've been in the fan works and fair use space actually since I was in law school when I was lucky enough to learn copyright from Peter Yazzie, who has become in the last 25, 30 years, basically one of the strongest voices in favor of an expansive and coherent and clearly delineated common law and ideally statutory law um, set up and schematic for transformative works here in the US, um, some of which has been we've managed to export to other places around the world. So I'm going to cover in the beginning a little bit of just what is copyright in general, and then get into some of the boundaries of what fair use is, what fair use might not be, um, primarily from a copyright perspective, although I'll be talking about trademark fair use a little bit as well. Um, trademark fair use is the interesting thing of you can compare Coke to Pepsi, but you can't um, necessarily take the Coke logo go um, and put it on um, a t-shirt, even advertising or promoting something else. So we'll get into that a little bit later after we've gone through some of the issues of what copyright is and what copyright fair use are. So the first question, of course, is what does copyright protect? And First of all, it's easier to get into a little bit of things that it does not protect. It doesn't protect ideas like a really rich guy with some cool high tech who's doing vigilante things um, in the US and around the world. Is that Tony Stark? Is that Bruce Wayne? I don't know. It's an idea. The expression of that idea, we'll talk about in a few minutes, that's what's protectable by copyright. You can't protect a brand name with a copyright registration, brand names or trademarks. Logos, on the other hand, can be protected by copyright if it's something that has enough originality. Again, getting into the issue of the Coca-Cola logo. You can't protect a single note. You can't protect a single chord, uh, no matter what's included in Leonard Cohen's song. You can't protect effort or sweat of the brow. In other words, if you spend a really long time compiling a list of, say, all Twitter users, whatever, located in Miami, Florida, that is not something that is protected by copyright, no matter how you arrange them. That's considered sweat of the brow. There are some cases from 30 odd years ago discussing things like um, compiling phone books. That's not something that's protectable by copyright. Um, facts are not protectable by copyright, which we'll talk about again in a minute. So that's why when people design maps, Obviously, there's creativity in the specific ways that a map looks, but one of the easiest ways to find out whether somebody is infringing on your map is to create what's called a paper town, which is a location that is included on your map but doesn't actually exist in real life. And then, of course, one thing that is not protectable by copyright is something that is old enough to be in the public domain, like the original Winnie the Pooh books by A.A. A. Milne, um, which has caused a little bit of a meme-oriented um, determination as to whether or not your Winnie the Pooh is infringing on Disney's rights or not. And um, if Pooh is in red, do not go ahead is the gist of it. If your Pooh is bare, you don't have to beware. So if your Winnie the Pooh is naked, then that is not protectable by copyright because that has fallen into the public domain. If your Winnie the Pooh is wearing a red shirt, that's protected by Disney's copyright. And you should be very careful about it. Facts, as I said before, are not copyrightable, which is why there can be 9,000 million versions of the same kind of story um, where that story is based on facts. There have been numerous films that are based on different parts of the life of, for example, Queen Elizabeth, going all the way back to the King's Speech, which took place when she was seven, eight, nine years old, and going all the way forward to, obviously, the next couple of seasons we're going to have of The Crown, because those are all based in facts. If somebody wanted to make another movie covering those exact same time periods, like the next season of The Crown is going to be covering the same exact time frame that was covered by the um, Helen Mirren movie, The Queen, that's not a copyright infringement of one by the other, because the underlying facts are not copyrightable. Now, one of the interests issues coming into play in the Prince case or the Warhol versus Goldsmith case that's going to be determined by the Supreme Court in the next couple of months is whether or not somebody's face to the degree it's protectable by copyright. Of course, 
someone's actual face is not protectable by copyright, although it might be a trademark, but the way somebody's face is photographed might have some copyright protections. But those copyright protections don't go to the person's actual facial features because those facial features are, of course, factual, the same way that the location of a tree is factual or a bridge or something like that. So what does copyright protect? It does protect original works of authorship, whether those works are manifested in literary, dramatic, musical, artistic, poetic, novel-based, movies, songs, computer software, architecture, and of course, the design of boat hulls. I'm not going to be getting too deep into the boat hull, boat hull issue here because I haven't seen any fan works that um, are boat hulls copying of boat hulls and boat hulls only give you a very limited amount of protection um, because obviously some of it is considered necessary and therefore is not protectable. But it is, you know, as a general rule, protectable by copyright. That's kind of new. However, where a work draws on a prior creation, the copyright protection only covers what is new and original. And this actually dovetails into a litigation that I was involved with last year involving the Harry Potter films and books, which Warner Brothers accused my client of copying elements of for medallions that they um, that were earned and won by people participating in virtual races. Um, Warner Brothers believed that some of my client's works were infringing on Warner Brothers rights, but what Warner Brothers was claiming copyright in were things that actually exist in real life, like as you can see from this picture, the Millennium Bridge in London, although in this one, it also has um, St. Paul's beyond it. Um, we had to explain to the judge that even if Warner Brothers created a film that has the shard in the background or has a scene that takes place on the Millennium Bridge, that doesn't suddenly give Warner Brothers copyright to the Millennium Bridge or the shard or the looks on the faces of the people walking across that bridge because none of that is protectable by copyright because none of that or none of that is protectable by Warner Brothers copyright because none of that is original or new to Warner Brothers. So it's not something that they're able to own. So one of the things about copyright is that it protects things for a very, 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 very long period of time. When the United States was created, copyright was included in the Constitution. The term for copyright at that point was not included in the Constitution. It was 28 years uh, with a renewal period as well. And actually, I think originally it was 14 years with a renewal period, so it could protect for 28 years. And then it became longer and longer, such that in the early uh, part of the 1900s, you could get a copyright registration for 28 years and you could renew it for another 28 years. And that was it. Then it went into the public domain. By the 1970s, um, copyright terms were getting much, much longer, um, and they would last for things for works that were on published for decades after somebody died, but there was still a limited period from once something was officially published. And if you didn't renew it, then it fell out of um, copyright and it fell into the public domain. And that's what happened with films like It's a Wonderful Life and um, Charlie Chaplin movies and various things from the Three Stooges, which became part of the public domain 20, 30, 40 years ago. However, in the 1980s, copyright owners decided that they wanted the period of copyright to be much, much, much longer. For example, um, if the copyright terms that existed when the United States was created were applied to things like Star Wars or Jaws, those would now be in the public domain and anybody would be able to utilize those works and do anything they wanted to with them that was transformative, that was an exact copy, that was a shot by shot replica, that was any kind of a follow on work. But as I said, copyright terms have grown and that isn't the case anymore. So now the public domain is very, very far away. Um, as you can see in the background here, this is um, an emoji version of Romeo and Juliet. And people can create emoji versions of Romeo and Juliet or versions of Romeo and Juliet set in South Florida with Leonardo DiCaprio and Claire Danes because it's in the public domain. 
somebody creating a follow on film um, or a re or a revamping of, of um, Romeo and Juliet, where there's singing and it's set in New York between Puerto Ricans and um, U.S. based gangs and call it West Side Story is absolutely something that can be done, but it doesn't give anybody ownership of the underlying work Romeo and Juliet. And that's why there can be multiple different versions of modern day versions of Romeo and Juliet. Nobody is obtaining copyright ownership either to the original source work or more importantly, to the idea of making a modern version of it, even with emojis. So somebody else could do an emoji version of Romeo and Juliet, as long as they're not using this this kind of combination of words and emojis word for word, then there's absolutely no infringement of any other work that also has Romeo and Juliet as told by emojis. Now, the awesome thing about the public domain is that for a really long time, almost 30 years, nothing was entering the public domain. It is extremely difficult to give up copyright ownership in something. And of course, copyright vests when a work is created, not when something is registered with the Copyright Office. So um, the notes that I made for this presentation today are all protected by copyright. For me to release that into the public domain, I would basically have to create certain language, and then that wouldn't even necessarily do it. Um, it doesn't make sense that you shouldn't be able to give up your copyright in something and put it into the public domain, which is one of the reasons people use Creative Commons licenses, because it gives all the benefits of public domain without actually having to, you know, jump through that specific hoop. The good thing, though, is that it doesn't look like the copyright terms are going to get extended um, on a significant basis anymore. So we're at the point right now where things are entering the public domain on January 1st every year. So on January 1st last year, as I said earlier, the A.A. Milner Winnie the Pooh books, um, at least the first two of them, all became part of the public domain. So, of course, somebody did a horror film featuring Pooh and Pig, Piglet, who turn wild, go on a brutal rampage, and kill all of Christopher Robin's friends. I'm sorry, was that a spoiler? Oops. It's called Blood and Honey. You can find the trailer on YouTube. Um, definitely not for kids, but it's an example of people taking advantage of things that are in the public domain to create a follow on work that doesn't have to be a transformative use. Yes, they probably could have gotten away with creating this kind of a trailer 10, 15 years ago without a problem just because of the scope of fair use and the transformativeness of this work. But now they have the ability to commercialize it. They have the ability to have it in mainstream movie theaters because it's based on something now that's in the public domain. One of the problems with regard to um, creating works that are fair use, especially either in an academic setting or for schools or even for school projects or other things that somebody might want to do for um, commercial purposes, is that a lot of policies and rules are out of date. Schools, much as I love schools, Schools are the worst because a lot of them have not updated their terms of use um, to allow for the creation of follow on works, transformative works and things that are covered by fair use for 10, 15, 20 years. You know how it is. Once a policy gets created, it goes up there on somebody's website. Nobody changes it forever. Um, and that's a problem right now. We have, for example, a 2008 um, fair, fair use analysis policy for all schools in North Carolina, whether it's on the um, elementary school level or the collegiate level, the state schools all have the exact same policy in place. And as you can see, the effect favoring fair use user owns a lawfully purchased or acquired copy of the original work, that's not an issue. That is meaningless. It is not something that's considered by the courts. It is not part of the analysis whatsoever. Whether one or a few copies made, again, not at all part of the analysis. The seminal case still from the Supreme Court involving fair use and follow-on works, although parodies in specific, involved a song from Two Live Crew, which sold thousands, if not millions of copies before the litigation had made its way up to the Supreme Court. That's not one or a few copies made, that's millions of copies made. And that was absolutely not something that was seen as a negative by the Copyright Office. 
the lack of a licensing mechanism, again, is completely irrelevant when a court is trying to do an analysis as to whether or not something is or is not fair use. Yes, the fact that there's no similar product marketed by the copyright holder does get into the fair use analysis a little bit, but not in a way that it should be considered one of the top five things um, that should be analyzed whether or not something is fair use. And again, it's a policy that's 14 years old and the case law has changed just a little bit since then. So if you're in a situation where you're either in academia or you're within a company that has fair use policies that were created, more than four years ago, there definitely should be an updating of them. And part of the reason I'm saying four years is because that's about how far we are away from um, a case involving Google and Oracle um, first being uh, looked at by the Supreme Court. The ruling's a little more recent than that, but just in terms of temporality, we have a situation where the court basically said, Google, very large commercial company, was able to use code written and created and copyright owned by Oracle. Again, very large major multinational company. And the court said that Google's use of that computer code was absolutely fair use. Now it's going to be interesting to see what the Supreme Court does in the Andy Warhol uh, versus Goldsmith case to say whether or not fair use is going to remain as expansive as it looked after Google versus Oracle. But as of now, so through at least January, February, March, maybe June, all of the policies that I'm about to start speaking about in terms of what is and is not fair use are well should be considered in play. Um, so I did also want to touch back on one of the um, public domain issues because there have been situations mostly involving the estate of Arthur Conan Doyle for the Sherlock Holmes books where there have been claims made that they are not within the public domain. There's another issue of this involving Warner Brothers and the song Happy Birthday. So you may have started to hear Happy Birthday in a lot more restaurants than you heard it in, say, 10 years ago, and that's because there was case that determined that even though Warner Brothers had claimed copyright ownership in Happy Birthday for decades, A, it was either an orphan work, which means that Warner Brothers is not the copyright holder and nobody knows who the copyright holder is, or it's in the public domain. Either way, Warner Brothers doesn't get to claim royalties on in it. Nobody should be paying it to them. Um, also, it was a very big situation for the estate of um, Arthur Conan Doyle, who claimed copyright in all of the Sherlock Holmes books. And the, I think it was the Eighth Circuit determined about 10 years ago that not only did they not hold copyright in it, they had to pay extensive amounts of attorney's fees to the individuals who had said that the estate no longer held the copyright in most of the Sherlock Holmes stories. The last four stories are still protected by copyright, but any features, elements, examples, um, stories that were in any of the other Sherlock Holmes books are all now absolutely able to be utilized, whether it's an encyclopedia or a follow-on story or a new film without getting permission of and paying money to the estate. So I want to go back a bit and briefly touch on how much guidance do guidelines provide? Because as I said, there's a case before the Supreme Court right now involving fair use. Everything that I'm saying in this presentation about fair use, not copyright in general, about fair use has the potential to change in the next two to nine months. Um, and I'm not going to try and predict, well, I am going to try and predict a little bit. I'm not going to try and say absolutely this is what the court is going to do and this is what the court is definitely not going to do. I have some very strong feelings about a couple of the issues that are currently before the court in the Warhol versus Goldsmith case, most notably the fact that there hasn't been any analysis either in the lower court or in um, the questions that were 
being asked by the justices during the Supreme Court hearing last month as to what the ownership of Goldsmith in her photographs actually is, because as I said earlier, she doesn't own Prince's face. So it'll be interesting to see how extensively the um, Supreme Court manages to get into that issue as they go through this analysis process, but we shall see. Now, one of the other very important things about copyright is that there are currently regulations as to whether or not you can, for example, crack the Digital Millennium Copyright Act protections that are on digital and electronic works, like, for example, a video that you get from a streaming um, subscription service, or a DVD or a Blu-ray that you go out and actually buy, or a book that you have downloaded. How extensively are you allowed to crack the, that copyright, and how are you allowed to remove the um, any ownership claims that are included within that work so that you can create a follow on work. The good news is the Copyright Office has something called the exemptions process and every three years um, they ask for people who want an exemption to the Copyright Act um, that basically gives a safe harbor for one or the other thing to say, we would like this exemption, we would like this ability to um, create something and not have it be inherently infringing. So one of the organizations that I'm involved with, which is the Organization for Transformative Works, has gone and obtained exemptions, um, as have a couple of, for example, um, documentary film societies and the American Library Association. So for example, you can buy a Blu-ray in a store and you can put it on your computer and you can crack the protection on it so that you can rip that Blu-ray and you can share that Blu-ray with other people so that you can create a fan vid or a documentary film that includes elements of that video work. And you removing those protections from the video is not an act of infringement and it's not an act that violates the Copyright Act. So this is relatively beneficial depending on the kind of creativity you wanna do. Now, if you wanna create fan art that's hand drawn, or if you wanna write fan fiction, or if you want to do a fan film that is completely filmed, or if you're engaging in cosplay, then these copyright exemptions are kind of irrelevant for you. But if you're trying to do something where you're actually using the source work in one way or another, then having these copyright exemptions is very useful. They're actually all listed on the Copyright Office website. And if anybody wants the link, then I can certainly share it with Atreya and she can um, send it around if anybody wants to have it. So there are a bunch of different ways that people can be inspired to create additional kinds of what's called follow on works. Um, and many of those kinds of things are create, are permitted by fair use. For example, a Monsters, Inc. Glee Club, um, which is inspired by the film Monsters, Inc. or Monsters University. And to I, this is actually a photograph that I took on the ride at well, at Disneyland where, um, so in that case, it's actually part of the canon, it's part of the content. But if somebody was to say, for example, create a YouTube channel of, you know, a Glee Club inspired by Monsters, Inc. or something, you know, related to Halloween or a whole bunch of different contexts where you can put this in, then that's the kind of thing that would absolutely be permitted by fair use. So the question that you have to address when you're thinking about what it is that you want to do is how can we think creatively? Um, Andy Warhol is a really good example of taking works that are protected by copyright, like a Campbell's soup label, and turning it into art. Um, different kinds of manifestations of ordinary packaging or ordinary labeling. Um, he also did it with Brillo, for example, um, and their boxes are very interesting ways to get creative with something that you might think of as ordinary. And then somebody decided that he was going to do follow on works inspired by Andy Warhol. And he basically creates works that are 100% or 99% identical to Andy Warhol um, boxes, sculptures, prints, et cetera 
et cetera, and then submits them to the Warhol Foundation and asks for them to be deemed official Andy Warhol um, and or factory creations. And they always get refused. And then he puts them on display as art, as not Andy Warhol's art, but inspired by, even though it's absolutely identical to. So that's one way to think creatively about somebody who's already been thinking creatively. So I'm sure everybody has their own strong feelings or not strong feelings about what fair use is and most importantly, what it is not. It's not plagiarism. It's not unethical. It's not an it's not an infringement because fair use is an authorized use of copyright. It's not uncreative. It is definitely not file sharing on publicly accessible sites. Taking somebody's book, taking somebody's film and just uploading it to another site is absolutely not fair use. It is not most importantly, a rigid and unchanging checklist from 2005 or 2008 or even 2015. It is not at the moment shrinking. Let's see what 2023 brings. And it is not an exception to copyright. It is a lawful use of copyright. It is set out in US law. And I love this imagery because it's an example of how somebody took Jack Kerouac's On the Road and turned it into art by handwriting the entire novel in imagery that looks like cars. And it's, an, it's a very artistic way of taking 100% of the original source content and doing something very different with it. Micro calligraphy, whether in English or in a different language, is a fascinating way to create something that is absolutely a follow on work, but interprets it or utilizes it in a way that's very different from how it was originally intended to be. So when you're doing an analysis of fair use, there are four factors that you have to consider. Um, as you can see, they're very different from some of the factors that we, were that we were looking at from the North Carolina list from 2008. These four factors have been elucidated over and over again by courts, including the Ninth Circuit earlier this the, earlier this fall um, by the Second Circuit in the case that's the underpinning for Warhol, et cetera, et cetera. There really hasn't been a split amongst the courts on some of these issues, um, especially issue number two, but the question of the amount of substantiality, which I'll get into in a second, has been um, somewhat the victim of a circuit split. So the first question, the first factor rather, is the purpose and the character of the follow on use. So why are you creating something? Are you creating it just to share online, whether it's on an ad supported site or something that's freely distributed like archive of our own? Um, is it something that you want to actually put on a printable book and sell via Amazon? Is it something that you are making dozens or hundreds of to sell on eBay? Is it something that you're creating for yourself? Obviously, the further away you get from taking revenue in for what it is that you are doing, the closer the purpose and character of this is something that the courts will smile on. But of course, pursuant to Google, Google versus Oracle, merely making commercial usage of something does not automatically mean that something is not fair use, because of course, Google was able to make fair use of code written by Oracle. Now, in that case, it's in part, again to number three, that the amount and the substantiality of the portion used was very, very min minuscule. It was about 3% of the overall code of this one specific program. So if Google had taken 50% of the code or even 10% of the code, then that might not have that might have been too much to balance correctly with the commerciality of what Google was doing. However, if we go back to something like the Kerouac inspired art, even using 100% of that book to create this art might 
co might constitute something that is using 100% of the source work, but the purpose and character of it is something different. It's art, it's something to put on your wall. It's not necessarily something for you to read, um, you know, while you're at home or are on an airplane or something like that. So number two here, the nature of the copyright protected work is a very interesting issue, especially when it gets into things like photography and how much of the original source work is actually factual. So if the work itself is something that has factual elements in it, then all of those elements can be utilized in any follow on work without infringing on copyright. It's only the extent to which um, there is something that is creative or inventive or original in the source work that manifests some protectability of it. So you have to, as I said, you have to really look at these factors organically and specifically in each kind of a situation in order to make a determination as to whether or not this one specific thing that you want to do is something that's fair use. Now, the last issue, the effect of the use on the potential market for or the value of the copyright protected work. That's not just the one thing here that I have created. It's if everybody who is a fan of this thing wanted to do exactly the same thing I'm doing, would that have an effect on the potential market for or the value of the copyright protected work? And I think that we've seen and the world has sort of manifested enough of enough evidence to show that freely distributing fan fiction or fan art has no negative effect on the potential market for or the value of the copyrighted work, whether those follow-on works are critical or laudatory or, you know, full of squee or full of angst, then it still is manifesting in a way that does not have a negative impact on the potential market for or the value of the copyrighted work. There is actually extensive evidence. Casey Fiesler, who's a professor out at CU Boulder, has done extensive research on this to show that, um, as has um, Mel Stanfield down at the University of Central Florida, they've done a lot of work to show that fan works themselves have a very positive effect on the potential market for and value of copyrighted work because it's used promotionally by fans promoting to other fans, hey, you're going to love this thing. So for follow-on works like GIFs and uh, fan music and posters and t-shirts and cosplay, all those different kinds of things have been determined to not have a negative effect on the potential market or the value of the copyrighted work. But there are situations where, let's say, for example, if everybody made a film and released it into theaters, or if everybody wrote a book and put it on Amazon for $9.99, then that might have a value um, impacting or a value limiting um, manifestation. So that's the kind of thing that a court will look at when they're looking into this specific fourth factor. So what is, as a general rule, a transformative work? It's something that shifts the context from the purpose the source work was created for to a different purpose or a different meaning in the follow-on work. This is from a 2006 case involving the Bill Graham archives. And uh, basically, the Bill Graham archives are an archive of uh, rock star photos, um, concert photos, and things like that. There have been other cases involving, say, for example, a photograph of Eddie Van Halen playing his guitar, which was used by a museum in a museum catalog to show the guitar that they actually had as a part of their collection. And that was determined to be a fair use because it was transformational in how it was shifting the context for basically what the purpose and what the reason for having this work would be. So the transformativeness and the meaning is basically what is seen to provide breathing room to artists who are reacting to the world around them because the world around us always includes works that are protected by copyright. We don't think about it when we're walking down the street that the buildings that are around us are protected by copyright. Wouldn't it be awful if we weren't allowed to take photographs in public because the building behind it might be, behind the person might be copyrighted? Well, this is an issue that actually manifests in connection with street art because street art is of course protected by copyright. The minute it sticks on the wall, 
it is protected by copyright. So there are a lot of situations where major multinational film companies are blurring the backgrounds. You've probably seen it on HGTV. If you watch the shows, you know, where people's houses are being renovated, there are going to be blurs of the art on the walls because they weren't able to, or they didn't have the time to, or they weren't interested in getting the copyright to, or the license for a copyright for the source work that's hanging on the wall. Either it's too expensive or they just feel it's unnecessary, so they blur it out so there isn't some copyright protected work hovering in the background. Now, one of the unfortunate things about copyright law is that while there are limitations on how long um, how long it's possible to obtain statutory damages and actual damages in connection with an infringement. There are no limitations with regard to either having something um, that is that's been infringed on for more than three years, certain damages can still be manifest from the most recent three years. So let's say, for example, you started infringing on something in 2010, and it's now 2022. The entity whose work you're infringing can only get damages from the last three years, but um, any of the infringement that took place before that, they'd be able to get possibly up to $2 million in statutory damages for, even though under normal circumstances, they shouldn't be able to get damages in connection with a copyright infringement that goes that far back. So one of the problems with, um, with fair use is even if you think that what you're doing is transformative and creative, we'll talk about this again in a minute, the penalties for being wrong are extremely significant. Um, one of the reasons why I think major multinationals are very concerned about an expand, an, a limitation, rather a contraction of fair use, is they don't want a situation where someone can come down the pike in 5, 10, 15 years and get millions of dollars in damages for something that was infringed on possibly because somebody thought that it was fair use a long time ago or it was fair use under law a long time ago, but now that policy has changed. So this is one of the reasons why I'm actually really strongly hoping that the copyright, that the Supreme Court does not narrow fair use because it just puts too many, too many things at risk. So while fair use allows everyone an opportunity to engage with others, other works in new and unexpected ways, statutory penalties are impractically high if you're reasonable but wrong. Um, there's a lot of us that are hoping that additional legislation someday comes through Congress, which absolutely reduces the penalties if somebody thinks that something is fair use or that they're creating a transformative work. And if you're wrong and your penalty is $250, you're more likely to be able to feel comfortable getting creative about something than you would be if, for example, the penalty and damages for it are $2 million. So um, one of the good things, though, is that there is a protection for any sites that are hosting third party content. Um, for example, if you are operating a, ser a Mastodon server, you don't have to worry about people posting copyright infringement on your server as long as you have a policy in place that says if somebody reports something as copyright infringement and you reasonably promptly take it down, you can't be found liable for having hosted that content. Um, unfortunately, however, um, there's no real way for a Mastodon server or an ISP or social media hosts, or most importantly, nonprofits, to know whether a particular use of the work is authorized by the rights holder or is being used legally under fair use. So having a terms of use policy that focuses on the takedown procedures so that it's very clear and that also um, requires the person who's submitting the content to indemnify you for whatever it is that you're hosting. Or if you're, for example, doing a gallery show, people are doing self-submissions, then you want to be able to take down something that's problematic and shift the responsibility and the financial liability over to them. I apologize. I'm starting to lose my voice. I had COVID last week and I don't think it's holding up as much as I had hoped. Um, I do have a little bit more to talk about, but I see we're getting close to the end of the hour. So I'm going to take a sip.
And if of we want course, to Heidi, thank you so much. <laughs> and while you take a take a little break, just a reminder to everybody to put in any questions that um, you might have in the chat box. We do have a couple of questions, but um, Heidi, maybe if you would like for another uh, five, seven minutes, you can go ahead. We'd still love to hear everything that you have to say, and then we can hopefully move on to the, the question and answer session to see if the audience would like to know anything else in particular. But okay. please feel free to go ahead. Thank you. Okay. So <laughs> um, as we had spoken about a little bit before with things like the North Carolina procedures, archaic rumors impact current creative endeavors. How many of you, show of hands or not, how many of you have been told that you can use up to five seconds or up to 30 seconds of any musical composition in a film or in a different musical work because that's too short to be copyright infringement? Um, how many of you have been told that you can use up to 50 words from anything, anybody else's story and that becomes not copyright infringement? Again, how many of you have been told that if you print out your work and you put it in an envelope and you mail it to yourself, that's a way of getting copyright in what it is that you've created? Yeah. So we'll talk about the last one first. Um, that's not true. Work in, um, copyright protectability vests the minute something is created, whether it's saved to your computer or whether you've written it by hand like this. Um, there's copyright in that. Um, whether or not it's truly original to get thick copyright or if it's only factual, like a little souvenir from the Dead Sea, which was on the note I just flashed up, that it only has a very thin copyright. Well, that's um, something that has to be addressed on a case-by-case -case basis. But either way, mailing something to yourself does not give you copyright protection for it. Creating it does. However, you can't sue for copyright infringement unless you have a registration certificate from the Copyright Office. Right now, it takes anywhere between four and nine months to get a certificate. Although if you need to litigate, you can pay $850 and you can get a little bit more quickly than that in two to three weeks. But you don't want that situation to be what's manifest if you're concerned about somebody infringing on your work. So you can either take a bundle of everything that's unpublished every 10 or 11 weeks and register with the Copyright Office and pay a fee, I think it's $60, $75 right now, and sort of build that into your creative creativity budget for the year. Or for each individual work that you create, if you're you know, doing a book or something like that, you can get a copyright registration for it before you um, start distributing it or anything like that. If it's photographs, then you can do a bundle of, a bundle of works in a single registration. Um, but again, you're only getting protection to the extent that the work is A, original, and B, something that is protectable by copyright. Um, there are companies out there, uh, law firms like Higby, among others, that um, take the rights from photographers, obtain the rights from photographers to send out really scary and terrifying cease and desist letters. There are even worse companies that, have you ever seen like on blog posts or anything like that, um, set of Scrabble tiles that spell a word or a clipboard that has a word on it or a typewriter that has typed an individual word? Well, there's a company that's used AI to create those for literally every single word in the dictionary. They send terrifying cease and desist letters demanding $250,000 penalties, um, or they will sue somebody in court. And uh, with regard to Higby, uh, their company, they have obtained rights from things like um, Agency France Press and Reuters that they will send cease and desist letters if you've used one of those photographs on a blog post or on a website or on social media or in a whole bunch of different contexts. And then you have to go back and either prove that you had the right to it or that what they're complaining about was so long ago that it is outside the statute of limitations and there hasn't been any change to the website and therefore they cannot be heard to complain about it. So there are all these different risks in connection with using certain kinds of um, senior works because there are these companies and individuals that will get very threatening about it. The question is, of course, whether or not they have a valid claim with what they're saying. Now, those Scrabble tiles, the um, typewriter, clipboard, things like that, um, 
there's a mixed bag because those cases don't normally make it all the way through a uh, litigation situation, but it is extremely questionable as to whether or not that kind of thing is protectable by copyright at all. So if you happen to get those kinds of a letter, um, then it's a very good idea to um, push back and say that they don't have any copyright protection in what it is they're claiming because there's no originality to it. So um, in terms of trying to create something in a responsive kind of way, um, it's one of the ways that a transformative work is most transformative. When you're trying, when you take somebody's original content, let's say, for example, an Elon Musk tweet, and you want to utilize it in some sort of an artistic way, that is the kind of thing that probably should constitute non-infringement and creating a transformative work if you're getting creative enough with it. But of course, taking on somebody who has the money to litigate or the wherewithal to go forward with some sort of a dispute about this um, is where it gets into the risky situation. Unfortunately, because of the way the um, case law and statutory law exists right now, there is no safe harbor for follow-on works that is bountiful enough to cover every Every, every single kind of follow-on work that people could create. Um, back in 2015, for example, the White House got into a very interesting analysis of fair use and transformative works. And they actually said um, that open, openly licensed educational materials that are being used to solve educational challenges around the world should constitute fair use. And the Ninth Circuit case involving the song Magic from the movie Xanadu, it's my favorite case ever, um, back at the very early part of the pandemic, said that extracurriculars could be just as educational as in-class activities. And therefore, the same parameters that existed for determining whether or not something was fair use in the classroom should cover all kinds of extracurriculars. And thankfully, even though the ruling was written clearly before um, at home schooling started taking place via Zoom and via computers, it covered that and it made it very clear at the very least in the Ninth Circuit that all those different kinds of things were absolutely protectable by, uh, by copyright, um, but also fell into the bucket of determining whether or not something was a transformative work. So um, I want to skip forward to the different kinds of content that people may be creating and different things to think about when you're trying to determine whether or not what you're creating um, has the potential to be a transformative work. Is there an open license version of the content you want to use? If there's a Creative Commons share and share alike modification license available, then you might not need to create a transformative work. You might be able to just fall into the license of the Creative Commons license or another kind of license that already exists, especially if it does allow follow on and modified works. Um, is there a legacy contract or some sort of an agreement, either within a terms of use policy or within a license agreement that puts limitations on innovation and engagement. In other words, does it allow you to create things but put limitations on what you can do with it? For example, Star Trek has created rules and policies that go back, I think, to 2016 as to the kinds of content that people can create as follow-on works, even fan films. But there are restrictions on how it can be distributed, where it can be shown, how much money can be spent on it, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the things I really hate about those kinds of agreements is they always say no professionals can be utilized in creating the follow-on work. Everybody Everybody needs an accountant. Everybody needs an attorney. We're professionals. Why is it fair for a company like Paramount to say that um, somebody who's creating a fan film can't talk to a lawyer? I don't think that's what they're trying to say, but it falls into the bucket of their definition. So depending on how cautious you want to be and how much you want to push the envelope, that's something, that's something to think about with it. Um, and that, again, gets into the, the issue of whether licenses are limiting your fair use rights. Now, you can always make the decision to do something that's permitted pursuant to a license without worrying about whether you're creating something transformative or that falls into the fair use bucket. If that's something you're going to do, save all the licenses and all the information and all the pages and all of the statements and all the content um, to PDFs, keep them somewhere safe, keep them on multiple systems, keep them in both a Dropbox and a Google Drive so that you have widespread access to it as you need it.
And then, of course, there's the question, what are you doing with your follow on work? Are you selling one copy? Are you engaging in mass production? Are you displaying it online? Who's getting the advertising revenue from where you're displaying it online? All these different questions that you can think about whether or not um, something may or may not be fair use. Um, and of course, all of this could change in the next nine months. Thank you so much, Heidi. That was wonderful, so informative. And um, I think all of the examples and the cases you mentioned uh, were, very, were very contemporary and I think relevant to some of the questions that have come in as well. So if it would be okay, is it all right if we move on to the, the Q&A session? For sure. Thank you. So um, one of the questions that we, that we received, um, it's regarding a documentary film that's being made from gaming footage from GTA Online. So maybe uh, I know the participants who asked this, by any chance, would you want to uh, unmute yourselves and ask the question or would you like me to? Sure, discuss? we can do that. Yeah, if that's okay. Oh, yes. Thank you so much, Heidi. It's been really, really interesting. And we're dying again from London. Yeah, so I don't Hi know all. if that's one question. I don't know if there's differences, there probably are between UK and US law, but maybe if we just explain our situation and what we're doing so yeah we're making a documentary it's entirely using gaming footage from gta online i think it's pretty clearly transformative it's about a production of hamlet that was put on inside gta online okay um we have some backing from the bfi which is the uh, british, british film Institute, yeah. but they're reluctant now to continue supporting us without having a commercial rights deal with take two who are the parent company of rockstar they, uh, after a long effort to get in touch with them, they said, no, you can't have a commercial rights deal. They didn't interestingly say, you can't make this film. They said, you can't have a commercial rights and deal. There is a thing on the website we, to say that, that, that fans can make yeah, films with but, their footage. But what okay. we, we're kind of thinking, okay, we really want to make this film. We've gone so far with it. We kind of want to know, do we need this commercial rights deal? We, A, to show it at film festivals, and then B, ideally, obviously, we want to be able to get it out to a wider audience, show it on streaming services, et cetera, et cetera. So we just kind mm -hmm. of wonder what your kind of thoughts were about uh, that position. Um, so hi, London. Um, one of my best friends from um, the Transformative Works universe. Um, I would have loved to have been able to connect you with her because she would have been perfect for this, mm -hmm. but she passed away in June. So I'm just going to carry on Susan's legacy and tell you what I learned from her that may be relevant in this context. Um, I've done a little bit of British film work, but of course, A, everything I'm saying is not legal advice and B, what I'm saying is definitely not legal advice in the UK. Yeah. So Obviously, there's a big difference between can I create this thing, which in the United mm -hmm. States, pretty clearly, yes, you can. Um, under fair dealing in the UK, you probably can. Mm -hmm. um, you might have, depending on the content that you're using, you may have some GDPR issues if people's names and faces and imagery are included in this and the need to get releases from them. Yeah, we've got, um, we've got, we've got I know you that. guys don't have the official GDPR anymore, but you have your own version of it, which is really close. Mm. So just throwing that out there as a thing. Um, but fair dealing should allow for commercial um, ramifications for this. I've done work in the UK for puffs um, or um, an increase, like an increasingly um, dangerous um, seven years at a school of magic and magic. Um, so we've dealt with some issues involving sta both stage performances and streaming and you know print versions of the plays and things like that. So. That's been my main interaction with UK fair dealing, but it's pretty clear that there are certain kinds of commercial usages that you can make, um, whether you have permission or not. And especially if um, you know the underlying company says, these are the different things that you can do. But the question of whether or not somebody is willing to show it is where you come into play here. So, 
someone might require indemnification. Someone might require, you know, for you to be in a film festival or something like that. And if that's a risk that you're willing to, to take on on their behalf, then you might have an easier time getting them to show you in that kind of a specific context. Um, I don't know whether you're able to get the kind of insurance um, for advertising injury in the UK that you can get in certain contexts in the US, but it doesn't usually cover um, you know, a deliberate um, act of infringement. It would normally be if something's inadvertent. Um, in the US, you shouldn't have a hard time performing and presenting this in film festival situations as of now, because it does meet all the requirements um, that you would likely need to jump through hoop-wise in terms of fair use. But um, obviously other countries, your mileage may vary. Um, Canada obviously is a little closer to the UK in terms of fair dealing, but depending on the commerciality of the um, film festivals, you have a little bit more wiggle room. I mean, here in the US, people have been able to film, you know, um, I don't remember if it's Revenge of Tomorrow or whatever, but someone filmed a black and white movie at Disney World a couple of years ago, um, sort of guerrilla filmmaking kind of style. And they've been able to do that at film festivals. Girl Talk has been able to um, be, you know, be performed at film festivals. So here in the US, you have a, probably a bit of a wider scope, but that doesn't mean you can't do it there. I do have a couple of other attorneys that I'm still working with on UK projects that intersect with fair use um, in the US and fair dealing in the UK. So I'm happy to, you know, put you put you in touch with one of them to get something that's a little bit more concrete. And I hope that was coherent. That, that's very, yeah, very coherent. Thank you. That's really, mm -hmm. yeah. And it, I, do, do, I guess in terms of um being able to kind of sell it to some you know uh, that that's I would I guess it depends so, it's them yeah. being willing to do it to yeah. take on that risk they or... have to be willing to take on that risk but yeah. here in the U.S. if you want to order a copy um of Patricia Oppenheim and Peter Yazzie's book for documentary filmmakers um it's a little bit out of date but they have more additional content on their website they're um she's still a professor at American University he's um emeritus but they are fantastic and they have basically the best analysis um, of those different kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Peter DeSherney at the University of Pennsylvania also has done some good writings on those issues. No, thank you. That yeah, our main our issue is that the British Film Institute will not give us the funding for right. a feature film if they can't basically have guarantee that it can be commercially um, released because it's a feature film that will be put on the cinema which is, it, it's odd because this film made with gaming footage that have been in the Whitney Museum and are sold as artworks. But when it comes to the film industry, it seems like they're two different, that the BFI are more like nervous than say than the Whitney would be, or, you know, um, and I don't think, I think that's just, it just seems odd that like some people are prepared to take the risk and mm. some are not. It's really frustrating. So, hi, I'm in Miami, um, and we're about to have the major um, art show, art shows um, that constitute Art Basel here in about two weeks. Mm. And if you follow me on Twitter, um, if Twitter exists in two weeks, if not, I'm on Mastodon. Um, <laughs> I will go around the convention center during Art Basel and I will take photos of transformative works that are being sold for anywhere between fifteen and three hundred thousand um, dollars. And they're all art. And the definition of what makes something physical, uh, whether it's sculptural or, um, you know, two-dimensional art, what, what makes that fair use versus something that's filmed isn't something that's been tested in court here in the United States. It's just how the industry has developed. And for example, if you want to use two seconds or a certain saxophone blast in music, in a follow-on work, you're going to be paying an extremely large license fee and giving somebody a co-creator credit. If you want to take literally a photo that you take of Mickey Mouse at Disney World and do something to it and then sell it for $300, if you're a popular enough artist, someone's going to buy it. <laughs> Why? 
I can't point you to a single piece of case law that explains that. It's just how it is. That's mm. so weird. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a whole film festival, by the way, called the Machinima Film Festival, uh-huh. which is made of gaming, gaming footage, films made yeah. out of gaming footage. So, if anyone's interested, go and check out some of those. Yeah, works. that's some really cool stuff. Yeah, excellent. That's so exciting. I think that was a wonderful question and kind of a case study for us to begin with. Thank you so much, Heidi, and thank you for the question. Um, I know we're already running a little, a little over time. Um, and I don't want to strain your throat any more than than we should. Um, would it be okay to ask probably just one more, and then um, in case of anything, we will uh, ask them to direct uh, any other questions, uh, maybe yeah. to you by email. And I'm happy to, and I'm happy to do this again next summer after we get some guidance from the Supreme Court. <laughs> we we'd love that. Um, a, a very quick question, probably just as a general advice to to other artists, um, and also in your experience, is it common where you see smaller artists being sued for copyright infringement for any fan art that they've created, or for any work that they've sold um, on Amazon or Etsy, where there's just mass production of um, fan based merchandise for yeah. albums, music? Do you see that happening, or it's more likely that someone will do a takedown notice? Um, for example, if you make, um, greeting cards that like one-on-one, like you make individual greeting cards that are inspired by Game of Thrones, Mm -hmm. Warner Brothers may, and you sell them on Etsy, Warner Brothers has a list that Etsy has and anything that matches up with these specific words gets a takedown automatically, whether Warner Brothers sees it specifically or not. And those are, you know, one of the many kinds of different ways that something could get taken down just by AI without anybody actually seeing it. However, if you're going to be distributing something on Tumblr or on Mastodon or on YouTube, then it's much less likely for there to be a takedown. About six or seven years ago, YouTube actually offered to cover litigation costs for certain of its creators if there was a fair use dispute. And um, like one of the companies that licenses um viral footage and makes it goes more viral, makes it go more viral, said, and this was in a panel that I was on at VidCon back in 16, said that they couldn't figure out, for example, any way for someone else to make fair use of Chewbacca mom, which was the woman who put on the Chewbacca mask and, you know, did the noises and it was funny, but they were like, well, we can't figure out any way for somebody to make fair use of that. And I was like, okay, so if you have you know, a nine-year-old who does something similar with their Legos and does a stop motion film of it where Chewbacca mom gets eaten by one of the dinosaurs from Jurassic Park, that's not fair use. And they were like, oh, okay, maybe. Because you need to think about something creatively. And I got what they were saying. There was no way that some news channel could take two seconds of that footage and put it on as a news story without really needing to get that license from them because they were using it for the same purpose that it was being distributed in the first place. This is a funny thing to make you laugh. But there are a whole bunch of different contexts in different ways that someone could take that original source material and use it for something that was a completely different inspiration. Uh, thank you so much, Heidi. Um, I will we'll let you go now, but we really appreciate you coming and speaking with us. Uh, the presentation was fantastic. There was so much, there was so much to learn, and I'm sure the audience felt that way as well. I know there are tons of other questions that are in my mind. So I look forward to speaking with you again and we hope to see you at the center soon once more. But thank you so much for taking the time out and teaching us all of the the intricacies of copyright, fair use, fan art, and um, we would love to have you again. So thank you. Thank you all so very much. It was fantastic. And thank you for the good questions. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Bye.